Hello, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues. Welcome to the next panel of Children's Security Forum. Within the 60 minutes or so allocated to this panel, we're going to be focusing on next borderless malicious strategies on the uses of the pandemic by state and non-state actors across borders. Uh, what we've seen in the recent weeks and months is that from states to multinational companies, criminal organizations and hackers, actors, both state and non-state, have attempted to take advantage of the global crisis we are experiencing since February, March 2020. What are the effects of the pandemic on security and problems of political violence? How have state and non-state actors been benefiting from the pandemic? What changes in their strategies and tactics shall we expect? This panel is going to offer an insight into some of the issues raised in the abstract of this panel. We're featuring distinguished scholars to discuss with us these topics. I'm happy to welcome in our panel, Dr. Nicholas Stockhammer, from the University of Vienna, Dr. Christina Shoriliang from the Geneva Center for Security Policy, and Dr. Jessica White, a researcher from Royal United Services Institute. Well, um, uh, having had this very brief introduction, I think that we should not waste time and move on to the first paper presented by Dr. Stockhammer, which is going to be an assessment of the threat development before, during, and prospectively after the COVID-19 pandemic. Nicolas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Emil, for this uh, very kind introduction. Uh, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure and an honor. I would have loved to come to Prague, but uh, as the events occur, so we are meeting up uh, virtually, but I hope that we will still have a good discussion and I'm looking forward to present some of my thesis to you in this framework. So let me start. Uh, I chose the topic transnational terrorism and COVID-19, which is a very broad topic and I tried to uh, separate, as Emil said, it's to distinguish between uh, before, during and after COVID-19. And uh, I will start with some thesis now, if it works, yeah, if it works. So I'm also working at the National Defense Academy, so I'm using the military terminology. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, what I think is the distinct characteristics uh, situational awareness before COVID-19. Uh, in the last two years, approximately, we have observed a constant numerical de decrease in uh, Salafi jihadist uh, motivated attacks in Europe. Um, this has also been uh, paralleled by the almost or even complete erosion of the so-called ISIS caliphate in Syria and Iraq. Um, basis for this development was the uh, gradual weakening of ISIS. Uh, some observers also uh, stated a, a growing insignificance of Al-Qaeda, at least for Europe, which is uh, not globally true, as I should mention. Um, very interestingly, uh, Islamist online propaganda uh, decrease steadily by a factor of seven. That means uh, during the peak times in 2014, 2015, uh, in the ISIS caliphate, there were uh, through official channels, uh, at least one or two videos produced uh, per day. Uh, at the end of 2019, this was almost uh, uh, one seventh only. So you can imagine it was once a week, maybe. Um, this also had a, a huge impact on the recruitment capabilities. Uh, we have observed a, a strong weakening of ISIS recruitment capabilities in Europe. And uh, also it, there was a, a strong impression that uh, what in terms of operations and also in the sphere of tactics, uh, there was a certain stagnancy. 
during COVID-19 in the last couple of months since the end of February, um, many terrorist organizations uh, in, the, in the sphere of uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda spin-offs and uh, other, other little groups uh, have at least um, claimed that they were trying to exploit uh, a COVID-related weakness in, in the uh, government sphere um, in, when fighting terrorism. Um, we have also seen a partial consolidation of ISIS and Al-Qaeda in sanctuaries, which means in, uh, uh, for, for ISIS, especially in Iraq, also par particularly in Libya, uh, for Al-Qaeda, especially in Mali and Somalia, and also in Europe, um, there has been a consolidation in loose franchise networks, as I should call it. Um, it, Europe in particular is facing a, an increasing problem with uh, returning foreign terrorist fighters, uh, except for the, for the short phase of, uh, of the closing of the borders, but uh, many have managed to, to slip through the holes and also uh, existing local cells are, are still a problem and we are tackling this uh, phenomenon at the moment uh, and uh, recent cases uh, are, are a good proof of, of this development. Also, we are facing a growing propaganda activity by jihadist organizations trying to exploit uh, the current situation. Uh, in, in, in this framework, there, repeated, there were repeated threats to actively spread the virus by coughing to other people in the, in the subway or, or on other occasions. And um, this has been very critically assessed, uh, but uh, prominently, um, um, prominently outed by, by the UN that there should be allegedly an, an intensification of operational CBRM planning uh, among terrorist groups, especially Islamist terrorist groups, uh, also in, in, the, in the wake of COVID-19. Uh, a recent research work of uh, my Israeli colleague, Boaz Ganoa, uh, he, he made a, a very smart comparison, as I think. Uh, he compared COVID-19 and terrorism as phenomena. Uh, he said that uh, both uh, cause and foster indiscriminate fear. Um, he, he compared infections with inspiration of perpetrators in the sense of the contagion, uh, the propaganda of the deed as, as, a, as a symptomatic uh, phenomenon. Uh, both phenomena would challenge and subvert the public's trust and destabilize. Um, both uh, phenomena uh, are, are, a, are a, a solid proof of the of the ongoing democratic dilemma, security versus liberty, uh, which means that uh, governmental bodies enforcing security automatically have to reduce liberty. Um, and this is a, a basic rights debate in, in essence. And not to forget the, the sphere of the economy, uh, both uh, cause severe harm with COVID-19, this has uh, only started in my opinion and we will see much of the outcome in the course of the next year. Uh, to tackle any of these, it is crucially needed to cooperate internationally. So this is uh, in, in a sense, the, the trans-border uh, approach to, to cooperatively tackle the, these threats. Um, uh, Ganoa and I share his, uh, uh, approach is, is uh, persuaded that uh, an effective struggle against any of these can only uh, be maintained by solid intelligence work and uh, it, this should lead to governmental action. Uh, also, it is important to enlist the public to fight both uh, terrorism, but also COVID-19. So it's uh, a question of uh, personal responsibility to, to alert if there's a, a, sus a suspicious, uh, su something happens suspiciously. And also uh, if someone thinks that uh, he or she uh, is infected, uh, it is uh, 
necessary to um, to to inform the, the the administration. Also, what I really believe, and this is a, a task for for the scientists and for research, uh, a clear understanding of each phenomenon is necessary. And uh, as Clausewitz said, in the case of terrorism, um, the, the nature of terrorism will probably always remain the same, but uh, its character constantly changes. And last but not least, uh, Gannor argues that uh, transnational terrorism is a man-made ph phenomenon but COVID-19 most likely is not. This is uh, probably the only difference he, he pointed out. This is just a, a basis for discussion. Uh, what are the geopolitical drivers for um, transnational terrorism? Uh, definitely in the case of Islamist terrorism, it is the ongoing failing statehood in the Middle East and uh, potentially resulting civil war. Um, this has also uh, a strong tie with the ongoing uh, US decommitment, which means uh, military withdrawal from the region. Um, also, there is a uh, strong take on the, on the possible reemergence of uh, Palestinian international terrorism. Uh, we are also observing with, uh, with a very suspicious eye the the latest uh, developments in China with the Uyghur minority. Uh, the Caucasus region remains a, a very strong security problem, just as in Afghanistan, where the Taliban have taken over uh, major parts of the country. And uh, there is still the ongoing fear, and we will see what the next president, either the remaining or the uh, newly elected U.S. president uh, will act. What kind? He, in what kind he will act? Uh, considering military campaign against Iran, and also we should not forget, which has in the last couple of months uh, not been very prominently emphasized, the uh, Iranian-Saudi antagonism. Uh, in especially in the United States and Europe, there is a, a reemergence of uh, left-wing violence and. Uh, uh, we have observed some, some cases in the last couple of months. And last but not least, um, also um, a spin-off of the, of the forthcoming U.S. presidential elections, uh, there is uh, some kind of insecurity regarding the counterterrorism approach of the next U.S. administration, which will have an impact on uh, most of these aspects I just have mentioned. Now I come to the outlook. What is the, the future of uh, terrorism and what are the impacts of COVID-19 on the development of, of global terrorism? Uh, in the, in, for any kind of terrorism, I think that COVID-19 uh, will accelerate prevalent dynamics uh, and intensify them. Uh, we, whoops, we currently observe a hybridization of, of terrorism in any sphere, uh, we will, in the in the near future at least, uh, still observe a, a strong geopolitical foundation of conflicts and terrorism, uh, which is what I call the conflict terror nexus. Um, COVID-19 will very likely lead to social grievances, the ero erosion of cohesion, as I call it, uh, some sort of ideological polarization, and this could consequently manifest in an increase of political violence. Um, on a systemic level, the biggest winner of COVID-19 is the internet, without doubt. I mean, uh, lockdowns, restrictions, people, uh, as we do now, have to communicate uh, online, so there is a strong tie to online radicalization, and uh, we will. This will have an, an, a huge impact on the development in, in this regard. Um, also, there will be further significance of single actor terrorism. The latest uh, cases in Paris, but also in Dresden, have pretty much shown that uh, uh, the, the single actor phenomenon is, uh, at least for the near future, the the prevalent dynamic. Also, uh, 
as a, as a spin-off of this uh, uh, recent cases, the so-called crime terror nexus when petty criminals become terrorists and we have observed intertwined milieus. Uh, this has a huge impact on the, on the development of the phenomenon in general. Um, also, in my opinion, there will be uh, um, some sort of uh, de ideologization, which means that uh, uh, ideology is, is uh, rather a carrier, but not the sole driving force. It will rather uh, be some sort of uh, post-organizational terrorist plotting where um, franchise-like structures uh, um, act on their own quite independently, independently, only with loose ties to a uh, to a center, organizational center. And we have observed this for, for some time now, uh, the right-wing and conspiracy-driven terrorism will rise drastically. And I think uh, uh, there is a, uh, an influence from any sphere to each other and that there is a, a question response scheme. And uh, so this will last for some time in my opinion. Yeah, uh, all in all, these are not very optimistic uh, uh, outlooks, but uh, we, should, we should face these uh, developments. We should try to tackle these problems. And I think uh, understanding these uh, developments is a good first step to the right direction. And it is the, the task of researchers to um, to, to advertise uh, their research and to, to promote knowledge uh, to counterterrorism bodies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicholas, for your very interesting presentation, very interesting paper. At the very beginning, I was kind of, you know, happy with what you were saying in terms of, you know, this lessening of terrorist violence in Europe, but then you like switch to the more realistic slash pessimistic outlook and what you've been saying is very interesting to all of us i'm sure and to myself as well because i'm the guy dealing with terrorism and radicalization so what you've been saying it is it is very fascinating and you know a lot of things to think through and to understand and to prepare ourselves to as well thank you nicholas once again thank uh, you very much Thank you. Um, let's switch to the second uh, paper, which is going to be delivered by Christina, Dr. Christina Shorel Young, head of terrorism and PVE uh, from uh, Switzerland, from Geneva. Uh, the basic punchline is that you know what we've been seeing recently is this increase in the amount of disinformation which is circulating about the pandemic. And that might be somehow related to some, you know, relaunching of, of violence, including intercommunal tensions, riots, hate crimes, rise of criminal governance and increased conflict. Probably this might be related to what we've been seeing in Nagorno-Karabakh as well, even though this is not an intercommunal tension, this is a intrastate conflict, but this might be related somehow. So Christina's paper, is going to address the link slash links between disinformation and the state of violence as we have it nowadays. So the floor is yours, Christina, please. Thank you, Professor Aslan. I'm very pleased to be with, with all of you today. I'm now going to share my screen with you all so you can see my presentation. So first of all, I would like to talk a little bit about um, exactly what Professor Aslan said. I'm gonna talk about how um, this COVID-19 has created uh, more disinformation and, and what, what these causes are of this disinformation. So first of all, there has been an increase in the amount of disinformation circulating about the pandemic. COVID-19 has been described as a generation-defining moment. Uh, reactions to the pandemic, or more specifically, the poor response of governments to the pandemic, 
has 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 especially to the public health crisis are setting off um, many types of political and violence including riots hate crimes inter intercommunal tensions the rise of criminal governance and increased conflict covid-19 also marks a global crisis because this is the first time in our generation uh, that the world is responding without any kind of U.S. leadership. By being the first social media pandemic, the COVID-19 crisis has been seen a steep rise in disinformation circulating on social media and internet at large. This has been a serious problem and has resulted in a reduction in trust in traditional institutions, traditional media, but also in democratic governments. The rise in disinformation has also resulted in reduction of trust in healthcare professionals and in science writ large, hampering the recovery from the pandemic. Disinformation has been weaponized by malicious actors, posing and, and, and as an increased health security risk. So disinformation regarding the severity, origin, and solutions to the pandemic has been purposefully used by malicious actors as a very effective strategy to sow confusion and distrust and slow the recovery of enemy states. This dangerous trend could worsen and prolong the pandemic, posing serious health security risks. The pandemic has also been an accelerator for authoritarianism. The pandemic has benefited authoritarian states. First, the state of alert and need for tracing of the virus has enabled an enhanced surveillance of populations. And second, would-be autocrats have used the pandemic to cement power through crisis time laws that erode democratic norms, such as delaying elections and granting of extraordinary powers, as we've seen in Hungary. Authoritarian leaders have also sought to use the predominance of disinformation to their advantage domestically not only to deny the severity of COVID's impact, but also to jail opponents and critics, as well as to silence and harass media outlets. Some authoritarian governments have attempted to use COVID-19 to enhance their soft power in an attempt to pr pr propose their model of governance as being more efficient than other countries. Violent uh, non-state hackers, actors such as hackers, uh, have also benefited from the pandemic. Uh, they have used it to legitimize their presence towards governments and populations. They have done so by providing health services, sometimes more efficiently than the governments gaining trust of their local population. They have increased their authority in certain areas by enforcing health restrictions. And they've also benefited from the effect of COVID on security forces and on a global distraction uh, to increases and decreases uh, of operations, especially in places like West, Western Africa. In multiple states, in Africa and elsewhere, rebel forces have used COVID-19 as a rallying cry to recruit people to their causes, preying on the grievances of the weakest in society. Overall, the pandemic has been accompanied by a rise of political violence. The, uh, the, the pandemic has also created opportunities for hackers. Hackers have in fact benefited from the pandemic and they're adjusting their strategies accordingly. They've increased internet traffic. Um, they've increased use of digital tools and less secured networks such as the home office as, as was just talked about. And um, it's, hackers have also been able to use the pandemic to increase efficiency of their phishing emails Phishing emails have gone up uh, 400% from just February to April. And the increased stress of hospitals has also made healthcare systems particularly vulnerable to cyber attacks on hospitals, which have gone up 500% uh, since the pandemic. Hackers are targeting hospitals for ransomware and are preying on staff who are exhausted and in urgent need of access to patient data. The pandemic has also created more opportunities for global right-wing extremism to propagate conspiracy theories. Uh, it, a global white, white supremacist groups have already risen 320% in 2019, uh, in the last five years, as 
has been indicated by the Global Terrorism Index, but now they are profited, profiting from COVID-19 by propagating conspiracy theories. They're calling to weaponize COVID-19. Um, they're calling um, actors to attack police officers, people of different ethnicities or religions like um, Jews, uh, Chinese, Italians, uh, minorities uh, writ large. They've talked about the end of days, that COVID-19 will spark an apocalypse. And they're talking about promoting ideas of creating zones, area nations, um, and they're using memes to attract youth. One of the most important things for us to do is to recover the digital domain. We have to create more digital literacy programs in schools to help enhance critical thinking skills. We help to help internet users to spot manipula manipulation and ultimately weaken extremists. We need more de-radicalization projects that use social media analysis to identify and engage with radicalized individuals. And the most important is we need fact checkers, social media campaigners to debunk online manipulation. Most importantly, we need to have more prevention programs in the domain of preventing violent extremism because there's a need to understand not only why people join, the narratives of why they're joining, and the networks that have been created. What can we expect? Uh, criminal groups are profiting from COVID-19. They're investing in gambling. Uh, Drug-driven cash is now uh, going into distressed businesses. Uh, the Afghan Taliban and multiple mafia groups worldwide are getting into the public health business. Terrorists and criminals are siphoning off government relief and funding both online and in person. And criminal organizations are investing their gambling and drug-driven cash into distressed businesses. Multiple media, mafia groups worldwide are getting into um, all kinds of uh, criminal enterprises that have to do with public health. So what we can expect these trends to accelerate, COVID-19 has already acted as a hybrid threat ex accelerator, and we can expect these above mentioned trends to become the new normal. As this is surely not the last pandemic, we need to learn how to deal with these threats, terrorism, cyber attacks, disinformation more efficiently. We can expect malicious actors to continue to use hybrid threats just below the threshold of direct conflict to achieve both their geopolitical and their security goals. There is some good effective strategy that is already happening um, to counter disinformation. Um, we need to bring back um, these kind of, we need to recover the digital domain. We need more people to work in this field. On the positive side, tech companies like Google and Apple are developing creative solutions like contact tracing, tracing um, app application program interface. Uh, the South African government uses a WhatsApp chat box to dispel COVID-19 myths. And the London-based artificial startup Benevolent AI uh, has scanned millions of scientific documents and have identified a promising drug. So digital digitalization the digital the internet and social media may uh, hurt us in the long run if covid-19 but it might also be uh, our savior so i think we have to look forward to some of the technological revolutions that will help us to ent identify uh, these th threats more effectively and i hope that um, some of these ideas will help shape better policy and we'll give you some ideas on how we can meet this incredibly big challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina, for this wonderful insight. I appreciate that you have not just sketched the overall picture of how this information leads to violence and conflict, but also have offered the general outlook uh, along with some policy responses. So this is very, very much needed today. Uh, well, we have the remaining third paper, and I'm happy to welcome on board Jessica White, who is going to tell us how the mechanism of radicalization 
uh, sorry, how 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 um, uh, extreme right wing and actors in this space are shifting their strategies in Europe. So an interesting angle to look into, given you know this new forms of radicalization that have been kind of you know animated by the pandemic. So Jessica, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me today. Uh, very interesting um, presentations from my co-panelists. As it always is for the person that goes last, some of the things that I will say have already been mentioned, but uh, I'll hopefully go into some more detail in, in a helpful way. I will share my slides now. So I'm gonna focus on the extreme right wing aspect of, of the, the shifting, I think we can say shifting threat landscape and how COVID-19 has, has definitely had an impact on that. I think uh, in order to start this conversation, we have to sort of identify what we mean by the extreme right wing. This tends to be an umbrella term, which can cause confusion because it, it lumps together so many different uh, ideologies and, and, and driving perspectives, um, such as, you know, it could be white supremacy or ultranationalism, xenophobia. Um, many issues are, are brought together under one term, and there's often even uh, difficulty in, in, in the use of what term, you know, it should be, should it be the far right? Should it be the extreme right wing? Um, there's no, uh, no consensus over this and it, it often can cause confusion in responses as well as uh, a difficulty when it, it crosses over with the mainstream far right. Um, uh, and that, that makes it a challenging thing to address. I think, um, it's also important to remember, I think as, as the far right becomes, uh, more commonly referred to as this rising threat and the new thing on the threat landscape, that there is a long history of, 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 of all of these different elements, uh, especially within white European um, history. Uh, there's, you know, violent national political groups have been established over time and have appealed to those linked um, to white supremacy, ultranationalism, Christian ideology. All of these um, historically uh, have been present and have even been connected by transnational links. Um, this can be demonstrated, you know, through extremists traveling across borders to join in the fights to defend national, racial, and religious identities similar to their own. Uh, for example, in the 1990s, Greek citizens traveled to fight in the conflict in the Balkans uh, due to their ideological support for the cause of protecting race and religion. And more recently, fighters have traveled to the Ukraine. Uh, these are just a couple of examples. So I think it's important to remember as this becomes a bigger part of the conversation, and especially in the light of the pandemic, that it actually does have a long history and, and it's decades old. It's just a resurgence of something um, that, that already exists. So um, in relation to the pandemic and, and the focus of this panel, I think really it's, it's important to think about how this has become an enabling environment for extreme right wing. Um, the impact of COVID-19 and, and subsequent government lockdowns have offered a, a breeding space for conspiracy theory, as Christina was saying, for disinformation, for extreme sentiment to explode online. Uh, and this is within both the mainstream spaces and the closed spaces. So COVID-19 you know, has offered the, ample opportunities for people to identify and highlight grievances that already existed. Often these were, you know, existing social challenges such as poverty and inequality, and they, they've taken these and used them um, and, and woven them into their existing um, ideological threads of contents. Um, this has come along with the reports of hate crimes against people of Asian descent surging, you know, in the United States and Europe. Similarly, the pandemic has amplified anti-Semitic tropes and calls for violence against Jewish communities. These, these themes already existed and have been repurposed in light of the pandemic and the, the issues that have been highlighted by the pandemic. There have also, like um, was said previously, there have been calls online by groups for the virus to be weaponized. Um, this might be through purposeful transfer, you know, to, of, of saliva, infected saliva to minority communities or law enforcement, um, or even uh, the use of spray bottles and things like this to, to transfer the virus purposefully. Um, ultimately, you know, the more time on, under lockdown that people have to spend online, this, this causes a potential um, exposure, increased exposure to this content. A common strategy of, of right-wing extremists tends to be uh, to attract individuals who are engaging with more mainstream content, mainstream far-right content and traditional media sources and traditional online spaces. 
and then pull them into the more extreme conversations that happen in, in restricted communities on platforms such as Telegram or Gab. Um, Many individuals in online groups in the far right are proponents of, of larger conspiracy theories like QAnon that we hear about in the United States and is even now transferring to the European space. And they've become very adept at, at taking advantage of the widespread fear over the virus and the pandemic um, and, and associating that to government actions and lockdown measures, and then inserting that into these wider conspiracy theories. And, and their long-standing narratives. Um, the space, I think, has been widened, unfortunately, um, by the pandemic and, and the polarization of the political environment. So there's been a bleeding of the extreme into the mainstream discourse. And, and by that pushing the mainstream discourse to the extreme, I think this is a potentially, you could argue, has exposed new populations to extreme right-wing ideology and push, you know, push people that you wouldn't normally have thought of, um, soccer moms in America, and, you know, different populations that wouldn't have been exposed as much previously into the space of, of more extreme content. And while they may not themselves or you know, far right politicians may not themselves promote extremist violence, the rhetoric of mainstream you know, far right political parties and media voices often mirror closely and feed into the extreme right wing narratives. Um, as was mentioned before, you know, many right wing parties have have tried to capitalize on the pandemic in different ways to serve their own agendas, uh, some with varying levels of success, but certainly there have been violations of rights and, and a move towards um, abuse of power in this environment. Uh, presumably, also, the, those who have already been galvanized into this space are taking advantage of the, the presence of more people online uh, for recruitment and incitement to violence. Um, this can be difficult to track in the online space, but there's certainly um, a, an increase of encouraging of, of racially motivated violence and political violence and even bioterrorism, as we were saying. An example of this might be um, there was a planned attack on a hospital in the U.S. amidst the COVID-19 outbreak uh, using a vehicle-borne explosive. And this man was shot dead by the FBI in the course of the investigation. But he had been under surveillance for a long time and was active in neo-Nazi chat rooms, voiced you know, radical religious hatred and anti-government sentiment. So there is, um, there is action being taken on this ideology as well. Uh, the convergence of the global health and economic crisis, as well as this polarization of the political spaces, um, has certainly fed this. And this is prevalent, I think, in the coverage of the pandemic in the so-called alternative media, uh, which encourages the spread of far-right ideology. Um, this can be seen in media outlets uh, such as Breitbart or in the US, the Daily Stormer and the Renegade Tribune. These are all open source, um, you know, relatively mainstream media outlets that have come to um, more encouraging people to disregard the health threat posed by the virus and, and they highlight the economic damage of, of the associated prevention strategies in a way to, to encourage extreme points of view. And this all feeds in with uh, ongoing anti-immigration and anti-globalization sentiments um, and that have been amplified by years of increased immigration to Europe. Accelerationism, this was something that was brought up by Christina. Uh, this theory uh, centers on the idea that rebuilding a racially pure world requires stoking chaos through mass attacks and taking up arms to spark a race war. This may sound very extreme, but this narrative has been served well by the current global health situation, as well as theories that economic collapse will follow uh, COVID-19. And this um, you know, would present the opportunity to de destabilize governments and security forces and leading to the situation of, of mass civil unrest, which then could be taken in advantage Advantage of in the US, for example, there have been unprecedented levels of gun sales, um, the incidents of, of armed militias and you know taking uh, bolder stances or, or bolder moves than would have been previously uh, common. So while it's impossible to predict how far this extremism will cross into violent extremism, it would be unwise certainly to, to underestimate the potential impact of the extreme right wing, especially in the space of loan after attacks, as was mentioned. And I think I'll wrap up with this sort of, it, this isn't, this is something that goes beyond the COVID-19, uh, you know, pandemic crisis, but certainly something that's been 
needs to be uh, looked at in, in light of how this pandemic has encouraged the spread of, of right-wing extremism. But um, the, the counterterrorism framework, I think, presents a unique challenge to law enforcement in the space of, of extreme right-wing and especially alone after attacks. Um, the potential you know, for violence ranging from individual hate crimes to attacks on supermarkets and hospitals or other critical infrastructure, these represent you know, a serious threat to security. And that's been recognized by governments as they continue to take action against extreme right-wing actors, even you know, within the limited space that's available uh, during the pandemic and the handling of the pandemic. Um, there's a, a tendency for the extreme right wing to be characterized by loose affiliations and a lack of central organizational structure, which increases the challenges of tracking and preventing and prosecuting this type of threat. Uh, Lewis Beam uh, has a concept of leaderless resistance that's often used in, in reference to the extreme right wing. And because the extreme you know, right wing tends to be more decentralized, for example, than, than radical Islamist groups that have a, a very well-known and well-advertised organizational structure and affiliations. Rather than organizing in traditional group structures, the majority of individuals who might adhere to these beliefs uh, would do so under this broad umbrella of, of relatively disparate beliefs and, and loosely connect in small groups or online networks. So often individuals who do take violent action are doing so without the knowledge or involvement of others who might be active in their same networks and platforms, which makes it very difficult to link them then to any kind of organizational structure. Um, in some countries, such as Canada and the UK, there have been a few designations of transnational far-right groups as foreign terrorist organizations. However, in countries like the US, there's seemingly more reluctance to designate domestic groups as terrorist organizations or to try and tie them to foreign terrorist networks, which is challenging um, in, the, in the light of, of the way that the last two decades of counterterrorism frameworks have been established around the threat of foreign terrorist networks and, and organizations. This hesitancy, um, and I'm using the example of the US, but this would be true in different, you know, different countries around the, the world. But for example, this hesitancy to, to designate groups in this way means that the US Department of State cannot hinder travel of individuals with allegiance to these organizations. The Department of Treasury can't criminalize financial support to these organizations. The Department of Justice can't uh, prosecute individuals for providing material support for these organizations. So you can see that there's a whole, um, domino effect of, of abilities that are blocked by designations um, or lack thereof of extreme right wing organizations or individuals. Um, as I said, this is made difficult, you know, by the way that the last two decades have built their their international agreements and their intelligence sharing agreements and legal frameworks around the threat of Salafi jihadi terrorism. Um, this designation and being able to link an individual to a foreign terrorist organization opens up the floodgates of applicable CT responses, which is not so uh, when, when organizations are domestic or, or not labeled as domestic uh, terrorism. Uh, this, uh, the, there also this links to a challenge with the threat of or with the legal definition of terrorism, because we as we refer to it as extreme right wing, then there is a legal definition for terrorism, but not for extremism. So this this definitional issue feeds into the challenges of prosecuting uh, right wing extremism. Another way in which this manifests and which is closely related to what Christina was saying is that there is the challenge of, of hate speech versus free speech. And when does hate speech or when does free speech turn into hate speech or when does it become incitement of violence? Um, and there's wide variances of, in approaches to this issue across the Western world. Um, European countries or might be more enforce stronger protections against hate speech, whereas countries like the US defend very strongly the right to free speech and therefore struggle to prosecute hate speech or extreme ideological content that hasn't yet or is on a blurry line with incitement to violence. So the, I mean, there is a hope that we can take lessons learned from the preventative space that have been learned over the two decades and, and not make some of the same mistakes that were made, you know, learning how to do uh, preventing and countering violent extremism, over, you know, over time. 
However, I think the extreme right wing presents some unique challenges to a lot of a lot of what has been learned about this space. This isn't a minority community problem. This is a majority problem, uh, and it's not easy to to profile or target communities where you might want to implement this programming in the same way. In the same, in along the same line of thinking, this is also challenging to address because most of these communities or many of these communities exist primarily online. So there's no physically identifiable communities um, in which to sort of put these preventative programming approaches. So I think ultimately the, the CT framework needs to be readjusted and, and reimagined in many areas to be able to properly address the threat of the extreme right wing and the rise of of which has been encouraged by the pandemic environment. Many thanks for your insight, insight of the paper, Jessica. It is actually fascinating to see how conspiracy theories permitting the pandemic debate have animated good old evils, bringing to life extreme wing, right wing mood and attitudes. So possibly during the start of the pandemic, this anti-East Asian sentiment that was quite widespread back then in, in February, January, February, was then followed by COVID-centered phobia of outsiders. And the, this like set of new phobias, they were heralding the start of a new age of xenophobia, probably like of the new age, not like COVID-centered necessarily, but animated by the pandemic situation. And as far as I recall, in the early 2020, there was even this urban rural kind of tension going on. I'm quite sure the same situation was in some other areas of the world as well, with city dwellers, urban dwellers being seen as a threat in some small towns and rural areas, as those you know, kind of kind of having the contagion in themselves, holding the contagion. That's why they were seen as a threat. By the way, several days ago, there was this entire lockdown demonstration uh, in downtown Prague. And it was also accompanied with extreme right wing flavor. And the demonstration led to clashes with uh, local police. So I would say this is something that's been going on on the global level. That's a global phenomenon and it's certainly worth researching because there is some new, like, new, there are no new perspectives, unfortunately, uh, that can be attributed to the pandemic situation in terms of the right, extreme right wing uh, mood and attitudes across the board. Okay. I think it's uh, the question and answers time right now. So I am appealing to the audience, to those who have been faithfully uh, listening to the papers, to the presentations, to ask questions. Now I'm sure that our speakers will be happy to respond to those questions. So just let me take a look at whether we have any questions at the moment. Okay, I see the first question by Daniela Naumov, and he is asking, that's the question I'm putting, uh, are people believing that COVID-19 crisis might signal the advent of second coming, really a work of disinformation? Some see uh, COVID-19 as a divine punishment. Okay, second coming in spiritual terms, Probably yes. Second coming of, uh, I'm not sure, but probably you guys uh, understand the question better than I do. I could take a stab at this, I think from the extreme right wing perspective that I, I don't think that, I think people are taking advantage of this opportunity to encourage accelerationism in this sort of sense of apocalypse. Not that this has birthed that idea in their minds, but rather they see this as an opportunity to to perceive to move that forward. So I think it's it's more about people taking advantage, uh, at least in the extreme right wing space, rather than believing that that this is a new thing that is you know somehow signaling a 
the end of the world or the end of the world as we know it in, in this in the way that we know it. Yeah, and I would say that this is a typical like response to any pandemic, any epidemic situation, like when you have some disease going on on a global scale, then people kind of, you know, tend to think that this is a punishment for sins. There's been around for centuries, probably for millennia, and there is nothing new under the sun, right? Like, like this attitude that, you know, this is the end of the world and the pandemic is going to kind of eradicate humankind and uh, and then, then, then that's it, right? Yeah. Uh, if, if I may add something to what has been said by Jessica, uh, in the sphere of Islamist uh, terrorism, the idea of uh, COVID-19 as a divine punishment uh, at the very early stage of the pandemic uh, was quite dominant. But when uh, it soon turned out that also uh, the Muslim population of, of any uh, country where this has been uh, so explicitly argued, uh, then they they were stepping back, st stepping back one 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 step because uh, the divine punishment met all of them. Also, their their um, uh, their fellow Islamist friends. So so it's it's a natural thing and not not a a divine thing. And this was pretty. Uh, clear after some time, also to in within Islamist circles, so they they were rather changing uh, their attitude and started to give advice how to cope with the pandemic. Thank you, Nicholas. Probably I would kind of link to what you've said and bridge it to your paper. So uh, as I said, like your presentation, it was very fascinating to me personally, given the research I've been doing for some time now. The thing is that there is less violence perhaps because of some logistical issues, but there are more threats of the use of biological violence and more propaganda, which might be also related to the fact that, you know, nowadays with people being locked in their apartments and driven to internet, like propaganda has a wider audience, right? Definitely, so, yeah. Uh, would you say that there is some qualitatively different take on the pandemic nowadays in the jihadist propaganda? Yeah. Um, it's a big deal for them nowadays. Yeah, uh, in the sense that I was trying to, to allude to it, uh, that uh, they were saying that... Uh, this is a unique chance for Islamists uh, to hit the, the states. They are vulnerable. Uh, they are not as resilient as they thought they would be. Uh, they, they have exposed their own weaknesses. Uh, governmental institutions are focused on uh, tackling uh, the, the consequences of COVID-19. So uh, the, the general take in the Islamist scene is uh, we should use this situation and to to uh, even worsen uh, the situation in order to 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 work into this uh, narrative that the, that the states are suppressing uh, the Muslim population and to to provoke moderates to join the Islam the the, the extremists. Yeah, but the, the general narrative appears to have shifted from from COVID-19 as some kind of divine punishment for the sins of the non-believers or whatever, to mm -hmm. like jihadist groups threatening to use biological violence, including mm -hmm. COVID-19 and some other biological mm -hmm. substances as well, probably. Yeah. Could, could we claim this? Uh, there, there was uh, a, a certain period, I would say that was in, in May 2020, when there was a uh, uh, there were some uh, pronunciations on that in, in, uh, in the typical journals, uh, but uh, the counter-terrorist uh, experts, they always uh, point out to, to one important issue. Uh, it's uh, terrorism can only take place if there is motivation and capabilities, as Boas Canoa says, yeah? And uh, they have a strong motivation they had ever since. Uh, now they, this was, uh, channeled by the very idea what is the outcomes of a, a, a small virus that it could uh, 
uh, break down the whole world, basically. That was their, their saying. But um, in the end, they are still, uh, how, would, how should I say it, victims of their own potentials. They, they are not able yet to produce uh, uh, biological weapons on, on a bright, brighter scale. So uh, the intention has grown, but the capabilities have not grown. This is what I would say. But in the propaganda, in the narratives, this is a, a very strong idea. But uh, since the end of May or middle of, mid of June, uh, it, there was a decrease in that. So thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. It was, a, it was a, a peak. Yeah. Th thanks a lot for, for your uh, feedback on this important thank question. Um, let's switch to the second question. Giga Turk is asking, would you agree that fake news wasn't very impactful in the pandemic? There was a period when serious media were saying it is just the flu. Well, probably this relates to disinformation uh, debate. So I'm giving the floor to Christina, probably. She would be willing to address this question. Yes, I think uh, it's a very interesting question. I, I do believe that some countries um, probably didn't, uh, uh, well, countries that are, were neighboring countries of countries that are having a serious issues, like for example, Switzerland with our Italian neighbors, uh, we took a very quick uh, decisive uh, acts against COVID because we literally saw what was happening to our neighbors. And I think sometimes in your neighborhood or if you're sharing a border with a country that, that is having a huge problem, you're much quicker to react and not think that it is the flu. But I think other countries were slower to react because maybe they didn't see as much what was going on in, in their neighborhoods or their neighborhoods were calm and uh, the pandemic hadn't uh, hadn't gotten so out of control as, as we have seen here uh, in Switzerland. And so I think it really had to do with your neighborhood and maybe um, different news channels were, 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 were sharing some of what you said is, is news that was less, less, um, less worrisome saying that it is, it, it's a flu and that it's not so, so bad. I think some countries also were worried about um, panicking their, their populaces. So they were being very careful on what they were saying. I think most countries knew pretty much very soon uh, from their intelligence services what, what the, how, how bad this is going to become. Yeah, thank you, Christina. I also think on a technical note that back like in the early 2020, we didn't know a lot about the virus itself, right? So there were some quite reputed check, and not just check, but some global experts as well saying that, you know, it was not a big deal, that the whole, you know, this COVID-19 was a, a, a bad sort of flu. So with advance of, of, of knowledge, with, you know, more information coming on, we have come to understanding that this is a big deal. But this is not just the flu, right? So this relates to what we learn about the virus itself. I think it, it might be important, if I can jump in, it might be important to point out too how, uh, whether you want to call it fake news or perspective that you're producing, um, but this feeds into people's willingness to get tested and uh, willingness to wear a mask and willingness to, perhaps to take a vaccine. So in that element of, of fake news or perspectives that are put, you know, through the media, I think it, it does play a role. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. Let's switch to the third and last question because we're running out of time. So Javid Ahmedov is asking which methods and practice can be added to the inventory of terrorists and extremist groups to terrorize people after post-COVID-19 world. What lessons have they learned? So this relates to what Nicholas has been telling us. And probably I will just hand on the floor. Thank you. Yeah. With pleasure. Uh, I think one of the, of the major uh, lesson that terrorists and terrorist organizations 
have learned, and I think this applies to uh, any kind of terrorism or any kind of terrorist organizations, is the, the, the growing role of the internet. And, and this uh, has to do with, with different spheres. The first sphere is the sphere of online radicalization. The second sphere is the sphere of online recruitment. Thirdly, it's about planning and uh, uh, providing the logistics for attacks. And the fourth sphere is how to, to, to uh, spread the, the whole story and to, to win out of the a terrorist attack. So, so to, to, to use the internet catalyst for, for, their, for this attack. And it's about uh, getting a wide uh, um, audience. And this is the easiest way to address the audience after a terrorist attack. For example, the recent case in Paris, uh, the perpetrator, uh, he has tweeted that this uh, act of uh, beheading the teacher was some kind of divine revenge. And uh, this message has been spread within seconds. And this has reached uh, a very broad target audience. So uh, I think this will have some, uh, unfortunately, some imitators, in, especially in France. And this is a, a good example how it, how it can be. Uh, this person definitely got radicalized uh, in prison and afterwards in, in, uh, in the internet. Uh, he was not acting all alone. So this is what I call the hybrid perpetrator. He, he had some assistance, and he was uh, not a, um, a lone actor in, in, the, in, the, in the purest sense. Uh, he shared his, his plans. He uh, got logistics, weapons, and he was driven uh, to the place where he uh, murdered the teacher. So, uh, and afterwards, he sent out this tweet. Everything happened online, from the, except for the, for the deed itself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Thank you. Well, I believe that's it. No more questions, no more time. So, dear colleagues, uh, dear audience, thank you very much for spending a wonderful hour, hour with us, sharing your insight and participating in a lively debate. Thank you to thank those you very much. Who, who, who asked interesting questions. I think the whole session has been very enriching. Hopefully, we will soon have the opportunity to meet physically because nothing can replace offline That's communication, good. so to say.